Hey, um, good evening, everyone, and good afternoon or good morning from wherever you are joining. Welcome to uh, Pleasure India chapters special session today. I would call it very special because you might have all heard about a new announcement into Hyperledger Labs. So Hyperledger Firefly uh, is a new project that got proposed. And currently it's in labs where it is evalu uh, evaluating additional proposals to its project. For example, addition of Hyperledger Fabric support to its project as overall umbrella. And um, so very soon it may even come uh, out of labs and become a graduated or incubating project within Hyperledger. So, and it's also very good time from community perspective being as a developer or whether you are a business developer, right? To get engaged on this project because you will see benefits of the project in all across these topics. And uh, today we have a very special guest from Kaleido uh, to present us on the topic of Firefly. We have Jim and Nico. Um, hey, everyone. So I'll hand over uh, Mike to Nico and Jim, over to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Arun. Uh, thank you all for coming here this evening or this morning or wherever you may be located. Uh, we, we're very excited to get a chance to talk with you about Firefly. It's a, a pretty exciting project. I've been working on it for a couple of months now, and I'm super excited to tell other people about it and hopefully get them excited about it as well. We, uh, we would love to get more contributors from all around the world involved in the project um, and, and also maintainers as well. Um, but you know, the, kind of the, the first step of that is just uh, helping people understand what, what is the project? How does it work? What does it do? What problems does it solve? So that's kind of the goal of today's meetup is uh, just an introduction to Firefly. If you, maybe you've heard of it, but maybe you haven't had a chance to see it in action or try it out yet. So uh, we're gonna do both of those things today. Um, but so uh, first, so, so my name is Nico Geyer. I'm a software engineer at Kaleido. Uh, I'm also the community lead for the Firefly project. Uh, so I you know, put on meetups, uh, run our weekly community calls and that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm gonna hand it over here to, to Jim Zhang, our uh, head of protocol and also co-founder of Kaleido. And he's gonna talk you through kind of what, uh, you know, the high level, what, what is Firefly? What problems does it solve? And kind of the, the, the story of, you know, how, how did Firefly come to be? Uh, so it looks like our, our camera was having some trouble there. <laughs> But yeah, uh, I will hand it over to Jim and uh, we will share screen here and Jim has some slides to take us through. Yep, thanks Nico. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Um, this is Jim. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders, like Nico said. Um, really uh, happy to be sort of back in this uh, very exciting community of uh, Hyperledger. Uh, I was involved in the community uh, several years back uh, when I was still with IBM. Uh, but sort of uh, faded away for a little bit uh, after starting Kaleido and were uh, focusing on some other technologies uh, like Ethereum uh, and Corda. Uh, but lately we've added um, uh, support back to the Hyperledger technologies, including Fabric and certainly Firefly now uh, as part of the, uh, the Hyperledger labs. Uh, so we're, we're all fully uh, engaged with the community again. So very happy to see uh, lots of interest um, on Firefly, from especially from, <clears throat> from India, that part of the world, observing our community calls uh, in the past several weeks. I think we've seen a lot of interest uh, from that side of the world. So very happy to meet you guys today. And uh, I'll just spend uh, maybe 20 minutes also uh, on the background, uh, just high level overview of what Firefly is, how it came to be and what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> so you can spend most of the time uh, after that with Nico to look at uh, what does it take to get started, whether you are on the consuming side or are interested in contributing uh, how to get started. So uh, just tap. Uh, okay. We need it to advance get the focus and then. Sorry, technical difficulties, advancing slides here. Something you would not expect. Okay, there we go.
Okay, awesome. So um, <clears throat> Firefly, what it is, uh, it's, uh, it's not a new T DLT technology, uh, but it builds on DLT uh, to be a system for uh, multi-party systems uh, solutions. Uh, when we say multi-party system, um, what does it mean? So I don't think Lido necessarily coined this term. Uh, I've seen this term used in, in other channels, in other uh, situations, but I think in general, it's, it's a new term that is describing a system where uh, typically it's, it's rooted uh, on blockchain. So it's a multi-party uh, uh, system where multiple uh, enterprises or companies or institutions are coming together to solve a problem. And the problem they're trying to solve usually involves data or, or, or uh, assets or uh, files to transfer from one party to another. And uh, it, it usually needs a blockchain on the bottom uh, of the solution because um, you want all the parties to have the same view to where is the data, who has it, who sent it to who, uh, and of all the parties that are involved in the transactions, you want them to have the, have the same view of the state of the transaction. So that's where uh, things are really critical to have a blockchain as sort of the foundation of such a system. But on top of the uh, blockchain layer, uh, a multi-party system has many other components that are needed to make things flow. Uh, all the things that you've seen in the typical centralized enterprise uh, IT systems, you know, reliable messaging, API servers, um, uh, file system storage, uh, distributed file system, uh, databases, all that are still involved uh, to make this uh, uh, such a system work. So at the end of the day, you find that to make a solution work across all these multiple parties, you have the blockchain on the bottom, but that's just sort of five to 10% of the whole thing you have to build. On top of that, you've got to build all these other things uh, to make all the, uh, all the data exchange work um, um, reliably. Um, so that's what we mean by a multi-party system, which is it's rooted in blockchain, but it's much more than blockchain. So that's, uh, that's sort of the space Firefly is targeting and is trying to uh, solve all the problems to, to accelerate the adoption of, of blockchain. Okay, just need to click. <clears throat> All right, so uh, uh, let's spend a few seconds on the sort of the, the problem statement. What are we trying to solve? Um, blockchain is definitely a, a groundbreaking technology, but it's so new that it's still in its early days uh, in the adoption curve. Uh, we've seen in the past um, six years, um, since we started uh, on this journey uh, with blockchain, there are interest in this technology from every single industry, regardless of uh, what industry, industry you are, you have uh, at least one or two problems that can be solved uh, that's not possible or very difficult before blockchain came into being. However, uh, we've also observed uh, to actually solve the problem, uh, the, the, the journey every uh, customer goes through has so many roadblocks along the way and they were sort of not expected. Most of the enterprises came into the space with a fairly naive view that, okay, I've got a blockchain, that's it. You know, I'm gonna write a bunch of uh, smart contracts, deploy to the chain and we'll be fine. But very soon they found out that, well, if you put the business logic on chain, then the data that needs to be processed by those logic also needs to go on chain, which, which means everybody will see it. And that's not gonna work in many of, or we can say in most of the uh, scenarios where you actually want the data, the business data, which has your competitive advantages or is very sensitive in its own nature to be held private only to the parties that are directly involved in the transactions. You don't want everybody else to know what that data is um, unless they are uh, somehow involved in the transaction, but you still want them to be involved to guarantee the safety of the data 
and to make sure there's a decentralized consensus. So you're sort of in this, in this uh, uh, um, tension between you want to share and then uh, you want to keep things private. So uh, every, every customer we, we've seen without a system like uh, Firefly ended up building everything from ground up. The, the, after the ledger is put into place, they start building many things um, uh, one after another. And the result is what they thought is you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months kind of effort ended up taking years and taking generations to get right. Uh, the first time they, you know, they may spend a year or even more uh, to get something end-to-end -end working, but when they trial it with their uh, users, they found uh, things are not working, so they have to go back to the drawing board and start over. So uh, it's, a, it's very unfortunate that a, a fantastic technology like blockchain, it's sort of uh, seeing difficulties in adoption because things that are needed off the chain that needs to be there to make the chain itself work. So that's kind of the problem uh, we're, we're uh, seeing enough of that we decided we've got to do something about this because as a company, we, um, we know this technology is groundbreaking. It's going to be very disruptive. It's, it's going to be strategic for the whole industry uh, going forward. But Unt un until these robot blocks are taken care of, are solved, uh, the adoption curve is not gonna be what we we like it to be. So <clears throat> uh, I've mentioned a couple of times that <clears throat> there, there are all these different components that needs to be built beyond the chain. So this is sort of a high level overview of what they are like. So <clears throat> at each party at the table, uh, they're running their own a uh, bunch of components, or you can say their, their own stack of components that are attached to the blockchain. The blockchain is definitely the, the universal source of truth. Um, but then on top of it, uh, they're building their own components so that they can do their processing, uh, business logics, uh, data exchanges, save their uh, critical data, uh, share uh, files, all that. So, um, you know, there, there's definitely uh, information that needs to be shared across uh, to the whole network. You broadcast, for example, a um, membership uh, joining the network. So that information is always shared everywhere. Uh, but, but you can also uh, say, I defined a new asset with a non-fungible token that I'd like to put up for sale for people to bid from, uh, to bid on. Uh, and that's, that's a unique uh, asset that needs to be broadcast everywhere. But at the same time, you also have uh, just peer-to-peer -peer, uh, data sharing uh, just between uh, two parties or multiple parties, but it's a subset of the network. So uh, there are uh, parties that are involved and they can see the data and the rest of the parties on the network are kept in dark. So private data exchange, um, you know, you want to do it uh, through reliable messaging. Uh, and you, you may also want to pin the information to the chain to utilize blockchain's data immutability and global ordering to make sure when multiple uh, parties are uh, submitting uh, ex uh, exchanges or uh, transactions together, uh, there is a global view to the ordering of who submitted first and who second and all that. So all that is, is very um, difficult because it involves off-chain components, databases, queues, uh, messaging uh, uh, systems, and the blockchain itself. So blockchain is hard enough to figure out, and now you've got to make it work with all these other enterprise components. So that's sort of the, the high-level view of the, the kind of things you have to make work uh, to build a solution. All right. So uh, now, it, if we look at the, the open source landscape, right? Um, as an enterprise uh, developer, I like to first look at what's available in the open source space for anything I'm, I, I'm uh, starting to build because open source is great. It usually gives you the best quality stuff and also prevents a uh, vendor lock-in. So that's usually the first uh, choice for any enterprise solutions uh, to start looking for solutions. 
Well, unfortunately, while there is a lot of um, open source projects in the DLT layer, right? Just to look at Hyperledge itself, there are at least five uh, different choices you can make. And of course, on the very top, uh, it's the kind of uh, special, uh, unique things you build for each of your own projects. And those are typical, uh, typically your own IP. So you have to build them uh, for the solution uh, specifically. And there's a big missing part in the middle that um, takes care of all the things we just described, things you have to build uh, on top of blockchain. And we haven't seen a open source project that addresses that space. Um, and as, as we said, out of a whole solution, blockchain is about five to 10%. And let's say the top layer, the, the, the special IP is another uh, 5% or 10%. In the middle, we have 60 to 80% of stuff that's like completely missing in the open source space. So that's what we're trying to fill in uh, with Firefly. Um, we, we like to think ourselves as um, to uh, blockchain what Kubernetes is to Docker. You know, this may sound grand, uh, but this is really a, a good uh, analogy. When we try to explain what Farfly is, we use this as analogy and people get it right away. Uh, remember, uh, I think around circa 2013, 2014, when Docker came about, it was great. It's, it's super, um, super slick. You can deploy things repeatedly and uh, you, you don't have to think about um, deploy things, configure things, when things run together, how do you config, config all the ports so they don't run into each other? Docker is a great isolation uh, deployment uh, uh, platform. It was great, it was so exciting and we're trying to use it, but we found that Doc, while Docker is sort of the beating heart of the new uh, architecture, there's so many things missing, right? How do you configure networking? How do, how do you connect? the instances of Docker is how, you, how do you name them uh, so they don't just run on IPs. Uh, so that's where Kubernetes uh, came in. Until Kubernetes, um, it was quite difficult to figure out how to uh, properly and efficiently use Docker. So um, Kubernetes helped Docker to, uh, to realize the, the promise of Docker. And we think Firefly, you know, we're still in the early days of Firefly. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll still be um, uh, trying to grow it uh, to become a real thing. But uh, we'd like to think that Firefly will, will help the adoption of blockchain just like Kubernetes to Docker's. Right, so <clears throat> um, now let's uh, look, at, um, look at what exactly uh, makes up Firefly. So as you can see from this diagram, Firefly is uh, a typical way to run Firefly is you, every party in the network has their own copy. So the thing that they run for their own organization is one we call one Firefly node. A Firefly node has these multiple components. We can look at them in more details later. Uh, but just like you run a blockchain node for your own party, you run a Firefly node alongside your blockchain node for your own party. So every party writes, uh, writes some components that may be mostly common across all the parties in this uh, network, but there may be some uh, specific tweaks they need to make for their, own, uh, uh, for their own deployment. And when you look inside a Firefly node, you see all the components we uh, were talking about earlier that are missing uh, from the off-chain point of view. So sort of uh, not on this picture, but it's assumed to be there as the foundation is the blockchain node. Uh, and a Firefly node is attached to a blockchain node. Uh, what it does is uh, it's sort of a collection of, uh, of elements. If you think of Firefly nodes as a, um, a collection of um, like a periodic table, a coherent collection of uh, atoms. So you've got um, uh, the core that is for, it's basically orchestration uh, engine for uh, a multi-party flow. Uh, it's got a, um, um, a 
uh, API that you can send messages to, uh, uh, send um, a file exchange to, and ask Firefly, please share this with this party. And at the same time, please uh, add a painting transaction to the blockchain, or uh, at the same time, mint a token to represent uh, this information because uh, this is going to be represented as a unique asset. So all those things uh, is very easy to do with Firefly uh, by just making a simple API call. Um, and then to talk to different kinds of blockchain technologies, uh, unique connectors. Um, Firefly is designed to be super pluggable. Pretty much everything it does is through a pluggable interface so that um, you, can, you can replace uh, what's there with a alternative <clears throat> implementation. As an example, a business logic, uh, <clears throat> when some events, so Firefly is completely event-driven uh, programming model uh, beyond the APIs. So when some events is published and it's received, how do I process it? Uh, you can write, um, you know, any, write the business logic in any uh, business uh, language uh, or a, you know, lo low code, no code type of tools or even uh, in uh, advanced uh, cryptography, uh, such as zero knowledge proofs or uh, uh, trusted uh, execution environments. So you plug in what uh, fits uh, your scenario the best. Uh, what comes out of the box uh, is sort of the, the common components that are uh, really useful for you know, uh, most of the scenarios. But if you have a special uh, need for a special kind of um, plugin, uh, you can you can swap in, or if there's not an existing plugin uh, implementation yet, uh, you can write your own implementation. And we're going to provide, as you uh, will see, with Nico's demo part, um, a very uh, good material uh, to write them yourself. And we'd love to engage with you to uh, to help you write your own plugins. So I mentioned that uh, it's very uh, pluggable. Uh, so um, all the um, major blockchain technologies uh, with the big three, Fabric, um, Enterprise Ethereum, and Corda, uh, it's all supported out of the box. Um, we have 100% support for Enterprise Ethereum already. We're working on, uh, very actively working on Hyperledger Fabric and Corda support. So we'd love to hear feedback from you guys and um, so we can accelerate uh, these components. Um, I guess I'll, I need to go faster for the remaining parts. Um, uh, so I'll skip this one. Uh, this is mainly saying a Firefly is leveraging blockchain, but it, it extends blockchain um, to make things much easier to build on top of blockchain. Um, and we joined Hyperledger uh, because it's the best place to provide open governance over uh, open source projects. And, and Firefly is a high quality components that we uh, contributed to this project. Uh, it's, um, it's not, you know, when you look at some of the code, they may look uh, pretty new, but that's because we're building the next generation of implementations. The current generation is already uh, in, uh, in deployment, in production systems with many of our customers uh, for multiple years. Um, and uh, the, the new generation is written in Golang to, to have uh, a better sort of community attraction. Uh, and uh, it's a improvement in terms of the plugin architecture as well. So uh, as part of our contribution, we have beautiful designs of the UI that allows you to look at what's happening underneath the cover. And hopefully this is something that will interest you uh, both as a consumer or as a contributor so we can uh, make Firefly uh, even better in the future. So with that, I'll um, transfer to um, Nico and he will show you how this thing works. Thank you, Jim, I appreciate it. Um, I guess, so I'll, I'll switch to, to my slides here. And, but while I'm doing that, uh, we can just pause and ask, you know, are, are there any questions or things that folks would like Jim to clarify before we jump into other topics? Uh, hi, Hal. Uh, could you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, so uh, you told like uh, it can be plugged with hyperledger fabric as well, right? So my question yes. here is, uh, if we plug in, uh, as usual, like in hyperledger fabric, we'll be using a database like CouchDB or LevelDB, right? So if we connect this uh, Firefly, where will the data go and store uh, in hyperledger fabric? That is what my question ah. is. Yes, uh, great question. So um, you still set up a uh, Hyperledger fabric the way you want, if you want uh, to use uh, CouchDB or the, the, the embedded level DB, uh, you can do that. Um, but understand that uh, it only has your on-chain data uh, in that database. And it's uh, the database schema is designed such that it's easier for the, uh, for the protocol to process state it's not necessarily the ideal way to save the data from your business queries point of view. So um, uh, Fabric, sorry, Farfly gives you a off-chain database that is a replication of the data uh, on-chain, but also your uh, private uh, business data that is not put on-chain, but is also critical to your solution itself. So you, you also have this database in Farfly off-chain that um, you can choose to replicate the information from on-chain uh, storage, but also has your uh, private data. And you can design uh, your schema to make that uh, be more efficient uh, in terms of queries from your solution. So that's, that's the difference between the on-chain state database where you get with Fabric and the off-chain database. Okay. so. Okay, nice. That's great, actually. So uh, querying is also a, a, a like present problem in Hyperledger Fabric. So if we go on uh, data, increase the data, like business will usually has many transactions per day. So increasing data might also make complex for querying. So that's great, actually. And another question is, uh, you were telling like there will be multiple nodes of Firefly, right? So each node will have the same data or uh, what is the architecture there? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so the answer, the short answer is it depends uh, and it will probably make more sense actually as uh, I get into my slides and show a demo. Um, each, and, and the reason it depends is because not every party in the network may be privy to all of the data in a certain transaction. So for, for things that are public, um, like the, the ledger itself, everybody will have the same, everybody will be working off the same ledger. Everybody will see the same blockchain, uh, but there may be data payloads associated with certain messages that only certain parties in the network have in their database. So uh, hopefully that'll make more sense as we uh, get into the next part. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So can I call it as uh, a hybrid blockchain? I don't, we haven't really used that term. Uh, I guess it depends on what you mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like hybrid blockchain is in there, but uh, there will be a public chain. But in the same thing, we can uh, I mean, create some subnets, private subnets between the organization. So uh, maybe if I see the so, demo, then I can. Yeah, uh, so, so Firefly is, is, is most definitely about combining the power of on-chain logic with off-chain business logic and okay. also having data on chain and off chain and, and orchestrating uh between both of those things so um from from, from that standpoint it, it it does it does both and uh, it, it leverages blockchain uh in, in a lot of different ways to, to be able to do that yeah i think uh just, just going with your analogy um maybe it's more of a twin brother to the chain rather than the hybrid because uh, it runs alongside the chain and compensate or complements uh, what the chain uh, is having difficult uh, difficulties to do. So, okay. all right. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, one question. Uh, sure. so for this, you know, Firefly, you mentioned that you provide you know off-chain database as well, right? So, what all databases do you support for off-chain? Ah, great question. Uh, I will cover that in just a second. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, the short answer is uh, right now Postgres and SQLite, but uh, it's it's very pluggable. Great, thanks. 
All right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, um, more question, if you don't mind. So, how sure. Do you, yeah, go ahead. The Firefly nodes, right? So do we have to actually share the certificates with the node? And how is it managed within the node to connect to the network? Yeah, good, good, good question. So there is a um, Firefly has a network registry API, and uh, so when when a new node comes up, uh, it can you can use an, an API to, to register the node to the network and provide the identity of, of the member that's running that one. Um, in, in terms of exchanging certificates, that is going to be dependent on. The actual the the technology you're using to implement the private data exchange. Uh, so uh, when we look at the example today, uh, we'll see the what we call Firefly Data Exchange HTTPS. Um, that is using HTTPS mutual TLS, and uh, there there is there are certs for each of the members on each of the nodes uh, that are sort of the um, set up by a deployment tool for you in the demo. And uh, to add to that, in terms of the identity, how how do you represent identity on the Fire, Firefly network? Uh, you will see in the demo that uh, identity is, is represented as Ethereum address. Of course, that's when you um, build your Firefly on top of Ethereum DLT. But if you are uh, building it on top of Fabric, for example, or even Corda, where identities are represented uh, as certificates, then identity in that case uh, in the registry will be certificates um, because identity itself is a pluggable uh, uh, component in Firefly. So uh, a follow-up question on that. Do you uh, like, uh, do you provide that, you know, as part of Firefly? Does Firefly provide, uh, you know, key management solution as well or, you know, integration to any, you know, hardware module? That's a great question. So um, at the moment, uh, we have uh, uh, implementations that uh, uses software-based um, uh, uh, key representation. So the key itself is in memory. It's uh, manipulated by the uh, by the software. Uh, but uh, we have uh, the the part that we built in the current generation has support for HSM uh, modules. Uh, we just need to port that over to, to the new generation. Uh, so there is an interface for signing things, uh, and we don't assume the, the private key is always, always available to us. Great, thank you. All right, um, and just real quick, apologies for the, I realized the video, or my, my computer I think right now is struggling under the CPU load of processing the video. We've, we've run this setup before and it worked a lot more smoothly. I'm not sure why it's struggling today, but uh, I'm just gonna turn video off for now. Uh, apologies for that. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen though. And uh, so you don't have to look at a black screen and we'll talk through, you know, how, how does Firefly actually work now? So. Um, we're kind of transitioning a little bit. Uh, we're we're going to talk about some key concepts in just like things that you can do with Firefly and how it works. Uh, and then I, I'd actually like to go hands on and show a demo of it, uh, show some examples of uh, you know the, the different types of things that you can actually do with it, and uh, so that you can actually see it in action because I I think that's uh, really helpful. So uh, to describe sort of the different types of things that you can do with Firefly. Uh, we have this cast of characters here who you may recognize from uh, computer science stories such as public private key signing and that sort of thing. Uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. So Alice, Bob, and Charlie all work at different organizations, uh, but they work in the same industry and they want to perform uh, business transactions with each other and they want to power this by blockchain. So um, I'll, I'll go quickly through this part because Jim did a fantastic job already of describing you know, the use case for Firefly when you would want to use it. Um, so, you know, but to, to summarize, uh, you know, Alice and Bob could stand up blockchain nodes on a, a shared chain and then, and then what? Well, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that they need to add in order to actually do business transactions on top of that chain. So that can be very difficult uh, when you have a lot of different corporations trying to work together and integrate with one, one another, it's very, can be very time consuming. 
And so that's what Firefly solves. Firefly is a standard for a, a way for businesses to perform uh, multi-party enterprise transactions powered by blockchain. So Alice can stand up a Firefly node. Bob can stand up a Firefly node. Charlie can stand up a Firefly node. They all register to one another and they're in a Firefly network. This gives them a, a ton of different capabilities. Uh, they can send data publicly or privately. Uh, they have the choice of making that on-chain or off-chain. Uh, there are different models, you know, event-driven or request response. Uh, they can send just you know, JSON objects. They can send blobs or binary files. Uh, in the very near future, there will be support for fungible and non-fungible tokens, as well as custom on-chain logic. Those are things that are um, either in development or will be shortly. And uh, there's also a, a very easy to use REST interface uh, along with web sockets and webhooks for receiving events out of the event-driven uh, model that Firefly has. And like Jim's talked about, it's all very pluggable. So uh, a, a lot of these things can be uh, replaced with you know, if you need a, a specific technology, a specific type of messaging system, for instance, that Firefly doesn't support today, uh, it's extensible. You can you can build a plugin to extend it. So let's talk about how do I actually get data? Um, you know, say Alice has a piece of data that she wants to send. So uh, the first way is a broadcast. This is a public uh, way to send data to every party in the network. So Alice has a piece of data she wants to share with all the other members. Maybe she's declaring, hey, I have this asset. Um, maybe, maybe she just needs to notify everybody of something that she's done or something she has. And so she can do use a, a broadcast to, to do this. However, uh, say she has a piece of data that is a transaction only between Alice and Bob and Charlie should not be able to see this transaction. There's also a way to send messages and data privately in Firefly as well. Um, in either of these cases, it's, it's worth noting that the, uh, the data payload itself will not be on the blockchain. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on this slide. So Alice has the option uh, when, when she's sending messages to other members of the network, whether that message should be pinned to the blockchain or if it should be unpinned. Uh, and e even if the blockchain is used, it's, it's a pin that's stuck on the blockchain, not the actual data payload itself. So uh, Bob can verify that when he receives the data payload that yes, okay, that is actually what Alice sent me. It's really from her and that was really what she sent. Um, however, there is an option to send data completely off chain if there is a need or a particular use case for that as well. So uh, broadcasts or private messages, pinned or unpinned. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, the actual things that you send inside the message could be just JSON objects, or it could be a blob. It could be a, a binary file. Uh, the data can be either inline in the message, or it can be linked. And uh, like we talked about before, it could either be public or private. Uh, and you can sort of mix and match all of these different types of things. Okay, let's talk real quick about the uh, the event driven model. So Jim said that you know Firefly is designed in uh, to be an event driven programming model. Uh, Firefly itself is very event driven, and the best way, probably the, the most recommended way to write an app that uses Firefly or to interact with Firefly is in an event driven manner as well. So. Alice has a piece of data that she wants to send to Charlie. Uh, Charlie previously has set up a subscription. We'll talk about what subscriptions are. I'll actually show you one in a little bit, uh, but it's basically just a way of saying, hey, for these types of events, send them to this place. And that could be a WebSocket connection, or it could be a webhook, just you know, a post to an HTTP endpoint somewhere. So Charlie has set up that in the past. Um, Alice has a piece of data she wants to send to Charlie. So she makes an HTTP post to the Firefly API. Uh, I've sort of, for the sake of this drawing, simplify the communication between the Firefly nodes here. Um, but when she makes this post, she'll immediately get back a 202 accepted. That means Firefly has received the message and it has it, it's safe, it will take care of it, but it the transaction is not complete yet. So after she receives a 202, she'll get, um, 
She'll get an ID back with that so she can correlate it later to uh, other events related to that message. Uh, Firefly will send the message over to Charlie via however he set up his subscription and uh, that will confirm the message. So once Charlie has received it, Alice will receive either again over a WebSocket or WebHook, a, an event saying that, hey, this message has been confirmed. Charlie got it. So the transaction is done. Um, at some point in the future, you know, Charlie's application may also generate some data as a result of receiving this message from Alice. And so then you could flip the whole diagram and Charlie could send some data back to Alice the other way. Uh, again, this, could, this message could be pinned or unpinned. Uh, the data that she's sending could be a JSON or a blob. Uh, this, this could be a, uh, a, a broadcast message to everybody, or it could be, in this case, we're only showing it going to one member of the network. But uh, remember, you can kind of mix and match all of these concepts of ways to send data uh, within Firefly to meet the needs of your specific application. Um, maybe you have an application that is not event-driven, or you have a specific need to work in a more traditional request response model. Uh, Firefly has a sort of translation layer built into it that allows you to uh, write an application in a traditional re request response manner. So uh, the, the key difference here is that when Alice makes this post, so this is a post to a slightly different HTTP endpoint that behaves differently than our other uh, broadcast or private uh, send message endpoints. This endpoint, which I'll show you in a little bit, um, we'll actually look at all the, the, the rest swagger and I'll show you all the different endpoints that are there. Um, when Alice makes a post to the re request endpoint though, uh, that request will stay open and will, Firefly will not respond to the request until it has sent the message all the way to Charlie. Charlie's application has responded to it. And that response from Charlie will be wrapped up in another Firefly message and returned to Alice. Uh, back as the response to her original request. So as you can imagine, the latency is definitely higher in this model because this original HTTP request will be blocked until Charlie's application has a chance to respond. Um, hopefully Charlie responds quickly, uh, but at, as you can see that this is definitely uh, not as ideal for throughput as the event-driven model. So that's event-driven is, is the, the preferred um, method of operation in Firefly, but the request response model is there too, if you need it. Okay, so Firefly is uh, is very modular, as Jim talked about. Uh, I'll just quickly highlight all the different things that can be plugged into Firefly. Uh, we, we've talked a little bit about it, so I, I won't talk you to death about how, how you can use plugins. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we talked about, you know, Ethereum support is there 100% today. Uh, Fabric support is in very active development and Corda is, is shortly to follow. So, so you can actually swap out, you know, the entire blockchain layer. Uh, it's worth noting that all of the members of the network need to be using the same type of blockchain right now, today in Firefly. Um, but it, all of the members of the network can agree, hey, for our network use case, Maybe Fabric is a better fit than Ethereum. And so we're all going to deploy Firefly and we're all going to use Fabric. Um, on the database side, there was also a question about this. We, there are plugins today for PostgreSQL and SQLite. Um, not all of the members in the network have to use the same type of database, though the database is their own private database. And so your different members could use different databases if they wanted to, if they had a specific need for that. Uh, the blockchain and the, the blockchain, the data exchange, and uh, and the and public storage are and probably the, the registry are the ones that need to be um, the same across the network. Uh, I just got a a little pop up from Zoom saying that participants can see my application. Are that you can still see my slides, correct? Yes, we are looking at your slides. Okay. Okay. Cool. I, I then I had the thought. Well, they've been able to see my slides the whole time, right? I hope. <laughs> All right. Um, Cool. So uh, yeah, the, the event transport, uh, all of these things are pluggable. So if, if you want to use something other than WebSockets or, or webhooks, you could do that. Um, here's just a, a quick look at, we, we talked about this diagram in our community call yesterday. Um, so there's, there's sort of multiple, um, you, you have the, the, the Firefly core process, 
Um, but, but a Firefly node is really a microservices architecture. And so uh, you can have, you know, Firefly is, is really a, an orchestration engine and it talks to many different systems to actually implement the specific functionality that it needs. Um, so Firefly has many different interfaces of sort of types of behavior that it defines in the code. And, you know, say you wanted to swap out uh, you want to do something other than IPFS. Well, IPFS makes a lot of sense in a distributed uh, system like this, but say you want, had a, a reason to use something else. You could write uh, a, some different client code here, just, just a little bit of code in Go that implements the public storage interface and talks with some other system besides IPFS. And boom, you've got a, a plugin and you can extend Firefly and work with multiple different public storage inter, uh, public storage systems. So um, won't go into too much detail here, but this is just sort of a picture of you know, the different layers of when we look at the, the Firefly application, how a, a Firefly node is put together. All right, just a couple of quick concepts before we get into some hands-on demos. Um, so namespaces, as well, when we start looking at the API, you'll see everything is prefixed by a namespace. Uh, a namespace is a way to uh, basically group related messages and data together. So um, your reasons you might want to use, a, so there is a default namespace that's there out of the box that you can use, uh, but you may want to use a different namespace, for instance, if you want to just run some test transactions, because blockchain is used here, the data is immutable, it's, it's on the chain forever, so you can't go back up and clean up test data afterward. Uh, so you might want to isolate that on a, a different namespace, so that your application can have a, a clean view of the world of the network. Um, you may also have a multi-tenant system where you want to run multiple different apps on the same Firefly network. Uh, you can segregate them by namespaces, and uh, this provides a way to do that. Um, okay, so messages. Uh, we're going to look at some messages here in just a second. Uh, a message is really just, uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, everybody has a message. Kafka has a message. Uh, SQS has a message. Firefly has a message. Um, a message is the way that you send data to uh, other members of a Firefly network. A message can have uh, multiple data elements in it. It can have a header section that describes how the data should be sent. And, uh, and it can have a, a group section in it that says who it should be sent to. So we'll, we'll look at some specifics here uh, now, actually, I think. Yep. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide over here. You should be able to see. Um, let's see. It says my screen sharing is paused. Just try to unpause it here. All right, should be able to see my desktop. Um, can you see Chrome? Yes. Okay, yeah, great. So um, we're gonna go hands-on now and actually show Firefly in action. And I'll try to go through this quickly because I wanna leave plenty of time to uh, talk about um, you know questions and answers and and have some discussion here at the end because uh, that's the, I, I think the discussion part of meetups is one of the the most valuable parts. So um, if you want to get started with Firefly, the easiest way to do that is with the Firefly CLI. So the the CLI is a tool. Uh, it is written in Go, so you can uh, right now you can install it with uh, Go install if you have Go installed on your computer. And uh, this is a way to set up a like a local development environment. So say you want to write an app that runs on, with, on Firefly, and you can use the CLI to uh, deploy a, you know, like, like you, I'm sure you've realized by now, hey, there's a whole bunch of moving parts in a Firefly network. Well, the CLI takes care of the logistics of all of that for you. It's not designed as a tool to deploy to production. This is a, a development tool. Um, so I'm going to show that in action now. I have it installed. And the binary name is FF. So uh, you can run that and it will tell you all the different commands you can run. So I'm going to FF init demo. Uh, it'll initialize a new Firefly stack. It'll ask me how many members I want. We'll say three. And then uh, I'm going to start it up. And then while it's starting up, I will kind of describe what it's doing. So um, uh, under the hood, the the Firefly CLI is using Docker. It's using Docker Compose to uh, basically start up all of the different components of a Firefly network. So there's a Firefly core, there are IPFS nodes, there's a blockchain node, 
there are data exchange nodes. Um, Firefly CLI is out, out of the box going to use SQLite so that the database um, is not going to have its own container, but uh, you, you could, there is an option, a flag that you can set to deploy Postgres if, if you want to do that. Uh, so, so this is basically going through and it's setting up all of the containers and it is writing a bunch of configuration and going to basically uh, register all of my members, deploy contracts, all of the logistics of getting uh, the, the Firefly network set up from the ground up. So um, I think my computer is under a, a lot of stress because usually this goes faster. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll just give this a minute here. While that's going, um, I just want to point you to the, the doc site. So if you're curious to, to read up more on Firefly uh, or what the different API endpoints are, you can go to labs.hyperledger.org slash Firefly. And uh, there's some different getting started guides here on uh, you know how to how to set things up, some examples of you know how to broadcast data, and then uh, the API spec is also here. So you can come to this page and see uh, all of the API endpoints. This is uh, generated by so the our, the swagger for Firefly is generated by Firefly itself at build time. Uh, so it should always be up to date with the latest version. Um, so you can come here and see all of the different endpoints. And um, my goodness, this is going really slowly. I apologize. Uh, I'm not sure. I can definitely hear the fan running. Yeah. I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm going to. I'm gonna uh, close some stuff on my machine to hopefully get some CPU cycles back here. Hold on. Sure. So in the meanwhile, you know, uh, would this uh, use Besu or Quorum right now for blockchain? Uh, so right now, uh, what the CLI is deploying on my machine is uh, using uh, Ethereum. So it's it's actually. Um, that the current version of the CLI, if you go grab it today, will use uh, it'll actually use Ganache as a just a very lightweight blockchain implementation. Uh, there's a an open PR right now to switch that to an actual Go Ethereum node. Uh, but as more types of uh, as other DLTs are implemented in Firefly, there will be additional uh, command line flags added to the CLI to set those up as well. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Okay, can you guys still hear us okay? Yes. Okay, great. I just switched my mic. All right, I'm gonna try my screen share again here and I, I closed some stuff on my machine. Hopefully that'll be better. I, I do apologize for this. All right, um, yeah, and stuff is not, let's see. I'm just going to try to start this up one more time. I'm guessing because things were just going so slowly, it timed out. Actually, yeah. Yeah, we, we can take a few questions while this is starting up now if you want. So if we talk about event-driven messages, it you know uh, feels like a lot similar to you know what Aries used to do, right? Uh, although you know obviously you have you know so many other features built in, uh, but in terms of messaging, you know it is similar to that, right? I uh, I apologize. I didn't I didn't quite catch the beginning of the message. What is it similar to? So Aries, you know Hyperledger Aries because you know it provides you that wallet and you can uh, you know have you know send out those messages without having to use blockchain. So is it similar to that? Um, okay, I'll, I'll take, a, take a crack at it. Um, so block, uh, blockchain messaging uh, is, um, so, so there are different um, technologies that makes 
uh, message exchanges uh, attached to blockchain nodes uh, possible. Um, so I think Aries is more of a peer-to-peer -peer, um, wallet to wallet. Uh, <clears throat> Farfly uh, messages are things that you send across parties. Um, you know, can be JSON payloads, can be um, can be referenced to a file or can be file itself. Uh, and and the secret sauce of messages uh, exchange between Farfly parties is it has a very proscribed uh, side effect uh, in terms of what, what it does uh, to the blockchain. Um, mainly two things can happen uh, when you exchange messages. One is it's going to be protected by blockchain. So after the fact, neither parties can deny exactly what kind of data was exchanged uh, in that transaction because it's pinned uh, to the blockchain. Uh, so the hashes and commitment is, uh, is immutable now. The other is uh, a global ordering. If multiple parties are sending their, their messages in, uh, let's say for bidding uh, for a, a, an asset, it's critical uh, for everybody to, to agree uh, who went in first and who second. So that's, that's the, 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 the kind of special treatment to messages uh, uh, for Firefly. Sure, that helps. Thank you. So you, you mean, you know, a broadcasting is also there, you know, uh, like not peer to peer, but I could actually broadcast as well. Yeah, so so a broadcast will go to all members in the network, and actually um, the demo's up, so we can we actually see that in action now if you want. Sure. Uh, just before that, you know, start. So can I have selective broadcast as well? Um, you so you can send data to multiple members. We don't call that a broadcast. We would call that a a private send to a group, and I'll, I'll actually show that as well. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so uh, the demo is up. So uh, my my Firefly CLI has finished starting the stack, and it says you know, here's your web UI for each of the members of the network. So I have three members in my network, and Firefly Core is listening on uh, por different ports for each of them. So five thousand, five thousand one, five thousand two. So you know, kind of using our, our characters from the slides earlier, uh, we'll pretend that this is Alice, this is Bob, and this is Charlie, and I'll try to. Um, use those same names as we're going through the demo and uh, so that folks can kind of follow along. So uh, here we have each of their UIs. Right now, they all look the same. There are there have been no messages sent through the system. So there's three members in the network and no messages, no transactions, because nobody has sent anything. So I'm going to go over to Postman here. Uh, I'm going to um, I, I'm going to send a message. This is from Alice. So I'm, I'm using port 5000 here to hit the first Firefly node in the network. And this will be a, we're, we're sending this to the, the broadcast message endpoint here. So this will be a public message that will be sent to both of the other members on the network. Uh, a message has a data element, which is an array. You could have multiple pieces of data here if you wanted. I'm just going to send one and I will post that. You can see I get back over here uh, an ID which I can use to look up this message later. Uh, Firefly has also hashed both the message itself and the pieces of data in it. And it's, it's told me that, okay, I, I got the message. We can see this is a 202 accepted and it's still pending right now. So we can go back and look at the Firefly dashboard here and we'll just refresh this. And we can see that the message has come here and uh, let's just refresh these guys too. <laughs> the demo's not working. <laughs> oh man, uh, this is this is wonderful. This, this did work last time. Um, so the other two nodes have not seen the message, and so this one is um, from that standpoint, Firefly is working correctly in that the message is still pending because the message hasn't hit the other nodes. Um, I'm going to try stopping it here and starting it back up again and see if that clears it. If not, then I'll just have to talk through the rest of the demo and I, I do apologize for that. The first time you start up a Firefly stack on your machine, it takes a bit of time because it is um, doing a, a lot of deployment and configuration setup. Uh, the, the next time you start it, it should start up pretty quickly though. It just has to basically go turn on all of the processes in the Docker containers.
hopefully this will get that message stuck unstuck out of the pending state and the other nodes will be able to receive it. Oops. And it did not. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Okay, cool. Refresh this one. All right, so now, now everybody has the same view. So uh, each, this is Alice, Bob, and Charlie all see the same message that has gone back, gone through the system. Uh, they can go here to the messages tab to see the actual message. They can see the hash of the data. If we go to the data tab. Uh, you can actually click on this and see the actual data payload as well. And there's there's the message that was sent. I think Nico was actually trying to show the uh, fault tolerance aspect of our <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, we will. Uh, that's a good spin on it. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'm just going to try that one more time just to make sure. Um, I'm going I'm to broadcast one more message here um, just to make sure that goes through as well before we keep going. Okay, yep, I think, I think we're in business now. Uh, I'm not sure why it didn't go through the first time, but now, now each member sees two messages have been sent through the system. So that's a broadcast. Um, let's look at a private message now. And uh, there was a question about, you know, can, can I broadcast a message to uh, multiple people, but not everybody? Uh, and this is, this is how you would do that. So we, would, we called, so the previous request was to the broadcast message endpoint. Now we're going to go to the send message endpoint. And uh, the, we've added a, a new thing to the message JSON here called a group with an array of members. Uh, we could have Many different, um, you know, however many members you have in your network, you could list out all the identities of the uh, members that you want to send this message to. In this case, we're just sending it to one. But if you, if, if we had more than three and you wanted to send it to two, uh, you could just continue appending identities to this array. Uh, so here we're going to send. We'll, we'll say this is a secret message. Uh, we've also added a header. Uh, this is not required to send a private message, but I, I wanted to talk about the header as well. So the header is where you can define some other fields that tell uh, you know, how the message should be processed. So this one, we're adding a tag on, and a tag is used to indicate to the other members of the network how they should process the data. So uh, for instance, you may, have, uh, you may send some, some data, and the message may be sent because it was a, a new customer order or something like that. And so the tag can be used to tell the other members, hey, this is a new customer order, as opposed to maybe an order that's being canceled or uh, revised or something like that. And that can inform the other members how they should process the data, um, uh, you know, independently from the data itself. Okay, so, so this is going to be a message. Again, I'm sending it from Alice's endpoint to uh, org one is, if we look over here, um, you know, member one is, this is Bob. So he's the, the, they count up from zero. So zero, one, two is how the orgs are labeled here. So we'll send this one. So what we should see here is Alice and Bob should both see this message, but Charlie should be totally oblivious to the fact that it happened. So if we go back over here, uh, we look at Alice's Firefly interface, we can see there are four messages sent and Bob sees four messages, Charlie sees two. And if, if you're counting, uh, you maybe wonder why we jumped from two to four. Uh, when, when we sent that group message, there was an additional Firefly behind the scenes sent another message initializing the group uh, between Alice and Bob's nodes. And so that was what this, this group Annette message was. And that's why we have four messages here. Uh, but again, so Bob can go look at data and we can see there's a secret message. However, Charlie doesn't have any record of this happening. Um, we can see the two Hello World broadcasts, but that's all. Okay, um, just doing a quick time check here. I want to show one more um, one more use case here, and then and then we can just switch to some question answer discussion time. So uh, I'm going to create a subscription here. So this is so Bob is going to create a subscription, and a subscription says um, you know when certain events happen or certain messages come in send them to this place. And we talked about earlier how that could be a webhook or it could be a WebSocket. In this case, I'm gonna demo a, a webhook. And um, so this is a post to the subscriptions endpoint. So this will create a subscription. And 
I'm going to define that subscription here. So basically, I'm telling it I, I want it to use webhooks. Uh, I, I give it a name. This could be whatever you want. Uh, subscriptions need to be unique between uh, the namespace that you're creating them in and name. So you kind of have the, the the two combinations. The combination of the two needs to be unique there. Um, and then I can set some options on it. So the most important option here is the URL of where I want it to go to. Uh, so I, I fictitiously called this the banana handler. So if somebody sends me stuff related to bananas, it's going to send a, a post to this endpoint you know, slash banana. Uh, I'm going to filter on things coming in to Firefly based on if they have the tag banana, then I'm, I'm going to send them to my banana handler. This will also, um, it will, so these options here, um, so remember how we talked about the request response model. So this is this is how I set up the far side of the uh, of the response. So basically anytime a message comes into this endpoint, uh, Firefly will wait for a response. It will get that response. It will wrap it uh, in another message as a reply to the original message sent to it. And then uh, it will tag that with banana response. And it will send that back to whoever created the original banana message. Hopefully that'll make more sense when we actually see it. So I'm going to create this. That's created. So that's um, basically, the URL that I had set it up here is going to send requests to this endpoint. Um, now I'm going to go back. To, so this is Bob, Bob set up that subscription. So when Bob receives messages there um, with the tag banana, we'll get an HTTP post over to here. Now Alice is going to go send a, um, let me make sure I get the right one. Yeah, so here's the request response one. So I mentioned earlier that that's a separate API endpoint. So um, this is to the request message endpoint. So we've looked at broadcast message. We've looked at send message. Now this is a request message. So this one behaves a little differently. So uh, here we're going to, the, the tag is banana because that's, that's what we have set up on the far side for the subscription to receive that. Um, this, the TX type I've set here to none, that means this is actually not going to be pinned to the blockchain. And for the data, I, I just decided to make it a little bit more interesting. So I created a, you know, a whole JSON object here rather than just a string called hello world or something like that. And then uh, here down, we've seen this group already. So this is uh, a message from Alice, from, from her API to Bob. Bob is org one. So hopefully that makes sense. So we're sending a, a private message. Uh, requesting a message in response from Alice to Bob. And so let's do that now. So we'll hit send. Notice how the latency was a little higher there. Um, this was not pinned to the blockchain, so it, it was actually pretty quick. But basically that went round trip from Alice's Firefly to Charlie's Firefly, sorry, Bob, <laughs> uh, to this request bin. And we can see that the banana endpoint was hit here. And we can look at, here we see the JSON payload that Alice sent to Bob. And if we go back to Postman, we can see what Bob responded with in the response. So the response is, itself is a Firefly message and it has data in it as well. So we can go down here, we can see, um, so this, this is the basically what Bob responded with. So he responded with a status 200. Here's all the headers that were on that HTTP response from request bin. Uh, you can see it's you know powered by Express, um, and then basically the, this request bin just responds with success true, and that's what's in the the response body there. So then if we go look at Alice's dashboard now, uh, we can see. So here was the private banana message that she sent. You can see it was with the with the tag there banana, and then. Here's the message that Firefly generated in response to that based on the HTTP response of uh, that request bin. So I should be able to look at this. Um, I can go, oops, I can go to, to the data tab and I should be able to see, yep, here's, here's the actual payload, the response that Bob sent. So um, that is it for the demo. Thank you for, for bearing with the, the technical challenges of doing a, a live demo. Um, appreciate your, your patience there. Hopefully the demo and the hands-on was helpful just to see some of the types of things that you could do with Firefly. 
Um, we have about 15 minutes left and just wanted to open it up for, for more questions and answers. I, I think some, some conversations have been going on in the chat. Um, but yeah, I want to open it up for, for Q&A and discussion now. And um, actually, before that, sorry, I had one more slide. And that's kind of you know what's what's next. Um, okay, so uh, just in in summary, um, I kind of wanted to to conclude with you know, what what what's next for Firefly. So uh, we are currently actively working on Fabric and Porta. Uh, those are Fabric especially is under heavy development right now. Um, if you are interested in Fabric or Corda. Those would be fantastic places to get plugged in, either building the connectors or uh, also the, the the plugin layer that, that goes into the core, or even um, you know if, if you have experience setting these things up uh, in uh, you know the CLI needs some integration there and some uh, additional options for uh, turning on networks with with other DLTs. Uh, so th those are those are areas that we're working on right now. Uh, fungible and non-fungible tokens actually is um, is being worked on right now as well. So that's that's coming up next shortly. Uh, custom on-chain logic, we we know we definitely need to have. Um, however, we're, we're holding off on implementing that until we actually have multiple different types of chains that we can work with so that we make sure we get that right. We don't want to design custom on-chain logic uh, for just Ethereum and then realize that we need to design it differently when uh, we have other chains available. So. We're waiting on that one until we get all three, um, you know, Ethereum, Fabric, and Corda, 100% supported, and then we will layer on custom on-chain logic on top of that. And lastly, um, what you know, what's coming up next in Firefly? Hopefully, co contributions from you all. Uh, we would love to get people involved in this project and uh, contribute to it. Or, uh, you know, if you're really passionate about it and want to uh, get involved. You know, long-term, we would love to bring on more maintainers for the projects as well. There's a lot of different repos, a lot of different parts of the project that people could have ownership over. And uh, I definitely want to grow this community. And that's why we're so excited to be able to share with you all uh, what it's all about today. So that's, that's it for my slides. I will stop talking now and uh, open it up for discussion and questions. Thank you. Jim, is there anything in the chat that we wanted to kind of surface in, in discussion here? I haven't been keeping an eye on it. A lot it. of great questions. Uh, I think majority of them are already answered either live or in the chat. Uh, there's one remaining one from Kent. Uh, <clears throat> he was thinking about the, 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 the glitch you hit and how you are able to recover. Uh, and that got him to think, uh, what's the backup strategy for... <laughs> Uh, for um, Firefly nodes, and what are the what do you think is the mechanism and the recover that allows it to recover right away? Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, so what I think happened there is we probably got there was probably some component of the network that wasn't talking to one of the other components, and just a, a restart got that to to work. Um, it was probably just a timing issue and everything starting up on my machine. Um, it's not typical, but um, so so what's the um, yeah, so I, I could just talk briefly about the um, kind of the, the deployment strategy. So, so Firefly itself is, it, it is a, the process itself is stateless. So um, you, can, you can run multiple Firefly core processes um, you, as long as, they, so, so the state really ends up going to the database primarily. Um, so if each, type of database that you use will have its own HA and redundancy um, sort of model. And that's you know, that's going to be dependent on which type of database you're using. Um, as long as, you know, if, if you wanted to scale and if you wanted to have HA for the Firefly core, um, you can run multiple copies of the process, um, but they, they do need to be talking to the same uh, databases, the same um, public storage data exchange within their uh, within that member's node. So you, so we talked about how a, a Firefly node is really like a whole bunch of different processes. And a node could have actually within that multiple Firefly core processes for redundancy or for scale. Uh, but it, they, they do need to talk to uh, the same source of truth in terms of where the data is coming from though. So um, yeah, so you, you could have a Firefly node crash in the middle of stuff and you know, all of the important state 
and status of messages in flight is uh, it's going to be persisted. And so if it comes back up again and it has a message, like we saw earlier that it, it didn't make it to the other side yet, uh, it's able to pick that back up and keep going where it was. Great. Uh, so Ken, hopefully that um, uh, fully addressed your questions. Um, don't know if others have uh, other questions to discuss. Oh, you wanted just to. What is the rate limiting step for Firefly node? I don't think at this point we have any specific rate limits on the API. Uh, so, you know, the, the design of a Firefly network is uh, <laughs> bottlenecks. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'll, I'll take that one in a second. So the design of a, of a Firefly node is that uh, only the, it's, it's sort of a, a private system for the member that it's been deployed for. So um, it's not like this is a, uh, you know, the Firefly API is not going to be uh, a, a multi-tenant API within um, within one node. So uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about like, um, you know, a whole bunch of other people hitting the API and, you know, causing, causing slowdowns. It's basically going to be, you know, however fast your application can go, um, you, you're only going to be limiting yourself. Uh, in terms of bottlenecks, though, that, that, that's a great question. Um, there, there is more performance testing and tuning and scale testing that needs to happen on Firefly in general. But um, the, so there's, there's, there's batching that happens within Firefly. A, a batch is a, is a very important concept within here that we didn't really get a, a, a chance to talk about in detail. But you know, anywhere Firefly can for throughput will we'll process things in a batch. So that's you know, when it writes a uh, a pin to uh, to the blockchain, that happens in a batch. When it writes data to IPFS, uh, that happens in a batch. Um, and so, so we try to we try to reduce the number of bottlenecks by by grouping data to get higher throughput. Um, but there's yeah the the database is one potential uh, bottleneck that I'm I'm a little uh, skeptical about until we run some hard tests on it. Um, the 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 blockchain, you know, just you know how fast you can get stuff. In and out of the blockchain might be um, yeah, the, we'll, 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 the short answer is um, we need more testing on it, and it's it's early in the project, and um, yeah, that's that's one of the things that we're definitely aware of. Yeah, um, as as Nico mentioned, you know we've we've seen uh, bottlenecks happening from past experience with uh, live uh, deployments, and they tend to be all the distributed components in the in the nodes, and that being the the blockchain itself and IPFS. Both are um, you know peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, uh, de decentralized technologies, and compared to centralized technologies, you know stateless server or even a database, uh, those tend to be slower than the others. Um, and for both components, we have designed um, um, uh, techniques to address that. So Nico mentioned batching for messages. So that's actually specifically. Uh, because of the uh, uh, the IPFS uh, bottleneck, uh, and then the adapters we built, uh, both Ethereum adapters and Fabric uh, adapters, will have uh, a, a a queuing mechanism in front of the blockchain, so that if you are sending transactions much faster than what the blockchain can process, uh, they will be uh, accumulated uh, in the reliable queue. Uh, Kafka is obvious choice, uh, so both connectors have a great support for Kafka, uh, so it won't be able to, to overrun the, the blockchain node. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, so Vikram had a, a question here about, uh, can we see the containers that the CLI brought up? Yes, you can, and I'll actually show you how you can do that real quick. So uh, the CLI has a couple of different helpful commands. Uh, if you just run FF or FF help, it will tell you all the different things you can do with it. Um, so First of all, I can see all, all <laughs> I do a lot of development with Firefly, so I have a lot of different stacks. You can run, you can have many stacks on your machine. So this is, I have like all kinds of different things in different configurations. Um, you can only run one of them at a time though. This is worth noting uh, because of port collisions right now. We've had thoughts about running multiple. Um, it'll be a lot to run on your machine, but uh, right now you can run one at a time. And if you want to see uh, what's running on one of them, so we were running the dev stack earlier, so I can run FF uh info on the dev stack is like a read the stack info and then it will tell me all about 
the stack. So uh, this first thing, this first table that gets printed out here is all of the containers and you can see the image, the Docker image name that it's using and the, uh, the tag and the image ID. So if you need to go check, you know, okay, which version of this thing am I actually running? Uh, especially as we're doing development on it, uh, that's, that's a, a helpful thing. And then the second table that gets printed out here is, this is what Vikram was asking about, like what's, what's running? And so uh, if, if it's running, this table will get printed out and it will show you all the things. Uh, it will show you all the, you know, so I can see that all these are running because the state is up um, and it will show you all the port maps that they have set up on them as well. Uh, so that's, that's how you can see. So this, this shows for each of the members. So um, you see zero, one, two. So these, these are like, these are the data exchanges for Bob, uh, sorry, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And then here's the Firefly course for uh, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. So that's a, a helpful thing to just see kind of what's going on there. Cool. Glad that answered your question. Thanks, Vikram. Good question. Uh, one more question. Uh, for you know, the purpose of like uh, governance, do we need some governance for this? For Fire, you know, if we use Firefly, is there some additional need for governance? Like, you know, for consortium, we need to, you know, have a governance that, okay, you know, how do we allow, what, what is needed to be allowed, you know, how to onboard a new, you know, organization. So does I mean anything else, you know, Firefly adds on top? Uh, I, I apologize. The audio was a little hard to hear. I, I heard it's membership governance. Yeah. How, how do we onboard new members? So basically, is there an additional governance that may be needed if I use Firefly? Yeah, that's a great question. So in, in terms of uh, membership registry, uh, so the membership registry is a core component of Firefly core. Uh, and that itself is, again, a pluggable component. Uh, at the moment, we have a centralized uh, implementation of that registry. Uh, in fact, the, the previous generation had a decentralized um, implementation of that registry, which is based on blo uh, blockchain itself. So um, based on the community needs, uh, we can bring it back uh, into, the, into the new generation and uh, Fabric, for example, has great support for decentralized governance uh, for membership management, uh, as does uh, Quorum and Besu. So, um, yeah, I guess the short answer is um, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's pluggable and it's um, uh, can both be centralized, simple, or, or decentralized, uh, democratic. Great, that answers. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we've got uh, probably time for. Maybe like one or two more questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right, well, if there are no other questions. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks again for, for giving this opportunity to, uh, to chat with you all today. Um, just really excited to, to share about Firefly and uh, get help people understand what it's all about and uh, equip people to be able to uh, get involved in the project. So uh, if you're interested in Firefly and you want to get involved, um, kind of you know, next steps that I would encourage you to take are uh, we're on Rocket Chat, and uh, you can join our, our Rocket Chat through the uh, through the, the Hyperledger Rocket Chat. I will uh, drop the link to that here in chat, so you can join that channel if you're interested. Um, and then also we have a, a weekly community call as well. And uh, the weekly community call is it's a little smaller audience than some of these meetups usually. Uh, it's a, a chance to uh, talk about Firefly, discuss um, you know upcoming. Uh, either existing architectural things or you know upcoming changes that folks may be interested in adding or changing in Firefly, and and also just to to discuss uh, things about it. So you can uh, I'll post here a link to uh, this is where our um, that's our our wiki page there, and you can see all of our community calls on there as well. And um, let me let me get the the link to the chat channel here as well.
Yeah. Yep, I had it right there. Oh, I, yeah. And here's the link to our chat channel. Thank you all very much for coming out to this meetup. Uh, it was great to get a chance to chat with some of you, and I hope that we can keep the conversation going. Uh, definitely join our, our chat there. We're, uh, I'm very active on there, and a lot of the other maintainers are as well. That's a great place to, to ask questions or, um, you know, if, if you're trying it and something isn't working right, it's a great place to get help or, or even uh, report bugs as well. And uh, we would love to continue seeing uh, folks, and uh, we would love for folks to get involved. So thank you very much. And I uh, hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you to Arun and uh, Vikram and others for uh, putting this together. We, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. Hope, uh, yeah. hope to uh, talk to more of you guys in the future. Definitely. Thanks a lot, Nico and Jim, for you know this exciting session. It was very insightful. And you know we learned a lot. And you know we are definitely hoping that you know this will grow your community as well for Firefly. Likewise. All right. Thanks Thank so you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.